Islamic fundamentalists and other unenlightened individuals. Callers and guests may be subjected to brash and offensive comments by the hosts and any other type of bullying tactics available. But that's okay. We know why you're here. This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system. Tonight is Monday, November 5th, 2007. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> What's up, Woe Tours? I'm here tonight with Mr. Chuck Browder. What's up? And Mr. D. Clements. Yo! Yo. Uh, tonight we have uh, special guests with us tonight. Ethan Dettenmeyer is going to return from St. John Smith, as well as Dennis Storhoy, who played in the film The 13th Warrior. Ooh. Yeah, good stuff, man. I get the Definitely. good guests. That's right. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so... Um, what do you think about this uh, the goings on in Pakistan, Mr. Browder? Oh, I, I think it's it's bad news, man. It's not only just that; it's the, what is it the the, the PPK too uh, out of Turkey? Uh huh. They're both causing trouble in the whole region. Well, man, you know it's just it's just a firebomb being ready to lit up, man. I mean, you know these guys are they don't play around. They got nukes out there. That's a scary world. Did you see the the, the video clips of all the judges and lawyers like? Uh, Charging at the police. Yeah, they were all in suit and tie. <laughs> yeah, they're, and the they're cops all, like, are all got identical. The, yeah. You know, yeah, it was good. It was good stuff, actually. And that's what's the the terrible part about it. It's all the people who are sympathetic to us that he's rounding up and putting in prison right now. Of course. Um, yeah, and it seems like uh, one of the rumors I heard earlier was that in the last twenty four hours, he's made deals with uh, Al Qaeda elements in Pakistan. Does that surprise you? A little the, bit, actually. And the U.S. has given this guy... The guy's a Hindu. Well, the U.S. has given this guy billions of dollars. I know, because country. because he, he's, he, you know, he's not a traditional Arab leader. Well, like I said, he, the guy's a Hindu. He, he he's, he's a Hindu leader of a Muslim country. He's which, maximizing his Which politics. is actually similar to what, what goes on in India as well, but it, I'm not sure that, that these people have been acclimated towards it. And uh, there are also rumors now, too, that he may have been... Uh, who was behind the, the assassination attempt of the woman, the former prime minister, oh, yeah, yeah, last that. week. And that doesn't surprise me either. See, just a bunch of these <clears throat> people worshiping these pagan gods, man. That's what's, that's what's <laughs> going on here. That's what's going on. The pagans. Vishnu and... Yeah, uh, man, yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember too many really of the other ones yeah. either. They all look weird anyway. I can't remember which one. What, Ganesh? That's the yeah, elephant one. Sure. Yeah. Those they, the, the I mean, I you know. can't trust a guy that don't eat a hamburger, man. I'm sorry. You just, I just don't trust people don't eat meat. You don't uh, vegans? No, I don't. I don't trust vegans. They're weird. <laughs> and they're skinny. <laughs> they're weird. I, well, I think, you know, honestly, all, all vegetarians are a little anemic, you, you think, know, one way yeah. or another. Yeah, I mean. They're weird. Man. And the majority of them I know that have grown up, you know, to have grown up. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. You know, that are, that are in their 40s or so, they, they all now eat, you know, uh, fish because of the maois and they don't consider i guess you know something without a face to be meat you know I, <laughs> fish has a face man. It's a little, little, little mouth man yeah. oh goldfish yeah they're cute yeah <laughs> you eat a goldfish? Puffers, yeah they're, they're, yeah. they're I, mean, I, I love puffer fish man i mean not not to eat the oh. great ornament ornamental fish i've never eaten them yeah suppose <clears> you can die from it though yeah, yeah in fact there was a, there was a case recently i think in japan where uh, a bunch of people ate uh improperly prepared fugu 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, ended up getting. I mean, who, s- who sits down for that and says, you know what? I'm going to eat something that could possibly kill me. <laughs> Go get him, chef. You've got to you've got to have a lot of confidence in the guy with a knife. Well, apparently it's heavy alkaloids that they have in them. And yeah, I mean, in, in the, the right amount, it, yeah, they could alkaloid poisoning. I mean, it could kill you. Great. <laughs> I like some of that stuff I've, I saw in uh, <clears throat> National Geographic, one of those channels where they went over and they'd actually showed the guy like eating like the live squid that while they were still alive it was oh, they're still yeah. wriggling as they're going yeah, down yeah. Throat. and and they said like the secret <laughs> was you had to like you had to like basically it, it starts a war when you put it in this, when you put it in your mouth oh god so it's fighting you and if you don't get it fast enough it can actually you can actually asphyxiate on this thing yeah cuz it will fight you it'll get it'll get lost in, in your throat. throat yeah who wants to eat something like that? Well, frat boys eat uh, live well, goldfish for looking. initiations all the time. Yeah, dude, but man. the goldfish don't fight back. I bet, I bet they do, man. Oh, they're pretty hardy. On. They're pretty hardy fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'll stick to the goldfish crackers. I think that's yeah. yeah. So did you? Were you ever in a frat, Chuck? You know, you no, don't strike no. me as frat we, we, we didn't have them at Guilford College. They were outlawed. You, you could be expelled. Really? For, for assembling a, a fraternity? Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh yeah. I went there for. Many years. In huh? fact, the year before I went there, a number of years ago, um, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to tell when that started. Um, there were there were a group of guys that did, I think, try and assemble a fraternity off campus. It was discovered, and they were all expelled. Wow, they don't mess around. Out well, there, because though. it's considered to be um, sort of an alpha male. Uh, of you course, know, it's alpha, alpha male. club. It, ex- it excludes, you know, women. Oh, God forbid! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. God forbid we exclude <laughs> the feminazis because that's what we had a lot of at Guilford College, and still today, I'm sure it still goes on. You know, the, you can you can always tell the ones they they don't have shaved legs or pits, and they're just well, walking I, around the summertime in the tank tops, and they're going, well, "Hey!" Honestly, <laughs> I don't see what the big deal is. I mean, you have segregated sports as well. You have women's volleyball, you have women's uh, softball, women's lacrosse. Yeah, you don't see men knocking down the door to be part of that. Although, <laughs> <laughs> unless you know it's some you know uh, B comedy that's <laughs> <laughs> being schlepped to you by Hollywood. I'm sure Ethan with Will Ferrell have, have to say about <laughs> or uh, uh, Adam seen, Sandler seen, uh, or uh, who, who's who's the Dane Cook is the new big one that they like to I'm schlep not, out from, from in the, these, these, these no. horrible comedies. Yeah. Well, no, you know the um, I, I just saw it the other week, uh, Blades of Glory. <laughs> yeah, you know I saw I saw it on Saturday night and it wasn't nearly as funny as I thought it was going. Yeah, but to it was be. still good. It was entertaining, but it was no Ricky Bobby. Yeah, or, I uh, haven't seen that. one. I haven't seen Weatherman, but I've heard that that's that's one of the better ones. Weatherman's too, that pretty they, good that he's done. Yeah. I haven't but, seen uh, Ricky Bobby. I haven't seen that. Ricky Bobby was hilarious. It has uh, Sasha Baron Cohen in it as a French oh, really? NASCAR driver. <laughs> Ricky Bobby. <laughs> Ricky Booby. <laughs> He's a nice. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Oh, man. Wow. Where do we come up with this stuff? You love that Sasha Baron Cohen, man. Have you seen uh, Borat? Yes, yeah. I have. It was hilarious, hilarious wasn't hilarious. it? Hilarious, yeah. It definitely was an Academy Award nominee. Material, well, it didn't now. Didn't the uh, the the University of South Carolina students, the racist kids, didn't they, they tried get, to sue him? I that's believe. what I thought because they didn't know. Well, they, was, I'm sure they signed a uh, a release form, you know, though, don't you to, think? Yeah, in order to even be in the film, or even yeah, have, they had the camera crew in the bus or in the RV with them. Well, I, mean, I don't know. On. We don't know how this was shot either. Well, and I kind of think it was guerrilla um, film as well. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you see a guy that's you know, I don't know, I don't know. I think there were a few times when they, those two guys that <laughs> they were riding around the truck nearly got their butts kicked man by some of the people they ran into oh, i mean especially man. that that whole hotel scene where they're naked and fighting through it i don't want to give it away for anyone who hasn't seen it yeah but uh that i'm sure was unrehearsed and certainly not cleared with <laughs> any of the hotel staff <laughs> yeah because what was it they, they 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 broke in on some convention or something it was there was a speaker up on the stage and the two of them were fighting naked yeah yeah the... <laughs> i can only imagine the lawsuits behind something like that Ooh. But Ooh. you know that that movie was was box office gold. Yeah, yeah. Pulling a trend on me tonight. Speaking yeah, that's what about to say that. I don't man, know, but I, I didn't want to dump on him. As, as, you know, I, right yeah, I, I don't that. even know where he's at. <laughs> where is Trent Lackey? He's MIA, man. He is. I mean, this is getting crazy. He's gone off. The he's grid. always late. He's always late. I'm gonna have to. We're gonna have to. Turned in his library card. We we need one of those. We, we need to punish him some way. Every time he's late, he needs to like give us five dollars or something. I don't know. No, that don't ever happen. No, and I, I don't know really what what you would withhold from him snacks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean uh, tap tap water, bathroom privileges. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can't pee. 
uh, that just might be a disaster waiting to happen there. Yeah, it could be. It's I may never want to sit in this seat again. <laughs> you have to bring your jug with you now, Trent. Or the box. The box. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we're, we'll get along until... Uh, oh, that's, that's I thought that was the, him. I, I thought that uh, that may, and it may have been Trent as well, but no, Trent is not with us. But I'll tell you who is with us, <laughs> and that is Mr. Ethan Deadmeyer. Ethan, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for coming on the show. No, man, my pleasure. Again and again and again. <laughs> well, whatever I can do, you know, to help out World of the Unexplained. That's right. That's that's, that's the awesome, kind. Man. That's the kind of stuff we need here. <laughs> you know, speaking of which, uh, not to not to get on a topic that no one planned for, but um, did anyone see the Notorious special on the Biography Channel on the Amityville Horror House? No. no. Oh. oh man, what a great what a great two part documentary on that all that craziness, man. It's just an excellent piece of work. I advise everyone to check it out. If you don't know anything about the Amityville horror situation or you think you do but you really don't. Oh, I think I do. Well check it out. You probably <laughs> do. <laughs> you probably do. Well, no, see, there's no one out here I can talk to that talk talk to about this. Nobody tunes into that crap. So <laughs> oh man! So I can get on this show and I can say, hey, let's talk about this Amityville horror. And we can. Oh man! Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's really weird. They had all those people that 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 died that that were associated with that whole thing. Like the author Jay Anson. Uh, it actually not Jay Aston, but Jay Anson. It actually um, yes, not to be confused with Jay Aston. That's right. It's right. but uh, <laughs> very he, much alive. And who I understand was actually on your show, by the way. Yes, he was. Yes, he yeah, was. First class guest, no joke. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and you know, uh, those guys are great. Gene loves Jezebel. Great band. I wish him the best of luck. And I you hope you know, they're... it's funny. Uh, we were just talking about them today. Not only are they a, a great group of guys, one of the nicer group, one of the nicer groups of people. But, uh, you know, they, they actually did do some pretty good music. And I think it was you and I, Jay, talking earlier last week. They're somewhat a victim of their image a little bit because the trends they set from a fashion standpoint had passed them by. And it was kind of like uh, they got, uh, you know, they, 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 they never, you know, here in the States, they did some great work. I mean, they really did do some nice stuff. And it was some, they did some pretty powerful stuff. But, you know, right now, in fact, I think right now they're on a tour, actually. Yeah, they are. They are. Well, Good I'm glad stuff. you could tell me these things, Jay. What are they playing? <laughs> I don't have the dates in front of me right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right, listen, let's come back to Jay Aston. We can talk about Jay Aston all night because he's a first-class guy. But let's go back to Jay Anson, who you were right. He is dead. He did pass away. Yeah, and, and you know, even the, like, I think... But as far as I can understand, it's not devil-related. Really? Oh, <laughs> Well, I'm pretty sure that the uh, you know the, the the coroner's report omits any sort of involvement with Satan. Well, I, you know, yeah, but <laughs> I mean, it's just odd when you look at the it, it reads like the Clinton death list. You know, I mean, if you look at it, because it's go. it, it's got go. all it's got all the names of all the people that were involved, and most of them just you know dropped dead within a number of years. Like I said, the author of the book, I think the first policeman that showed up on the scene. Uh, a lot of different people that oh, were you know, they involved. Didn't get into, they didn't get into, in, into any of that, but I'll tell you what was interesting. is they, It was the first documentary I saw that actually examined the DeFeo trial. Oh, okay. Uh, his yeah. whole history. His whole history. He was a screwed-up guy. Yeah, that's the one thing that a lot of people overlook. Now, what, no, regardless of what you believe, I, I'm, I'm personally I'm very optimistic. I hope a lot of that stuff was true, because that tells me I'll at least be able to terrorize somebody after I die. <laughs> You know, at least be able to come back from the dead and terrorize an innocent family. <laughs> now, now, for some people that don't know, uh, <clears throat> DeFeo um, was actually, um, <clears throat> excuse me, DeFeo was actually one of the kids that lived in the house. And basically the story goes that he takes a shotgun. This is a true story. He takes a shotgun one night around 3.15 in the morning at the Amityville house, and he kills his parents and his sisters and his brothers. Yeah, he claimed... Um According to this special, you know, I read the book by Jansen too. Which, if, if people haven't read that, oh, great book. That's almost a must read. Oh yeah, great book. It's w whatever you think or whatever your your opinion is, it is one of the more entertaining books you can possibly read. I mean, it's just it's it's an amazing piece of work, and I probably read it in one afternoon as a kid. But yeah, he he basically gets the ball rolling, claims to hear voices in his head, and apparently somebody, a person shows up at three three fifteen in the morning with black hands and hands him a gun. And he goes on a killing spree and shoots everyone in his household. But 
what's sort of omitted, it's not omitted from court documents in the trial, but what's omitted from sort of the, uh, you know, the history of the situation is was his, you know, almost pile-driving narcotics use. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the abusive situation within the house. And uh, now you you know that the, there's a there's another broadcaster, <clears throat> a friend of mine from a number of years ago, Lou Gentilly, broadcast out of uh, Philadelphia, mm-hmm. and Lou is actually really good friends with um, with the Warrens um, as well, and you know they're the ones that came in and actually yeah, did the, the Warrens really support it. And I know Lorraine from uh, and uh, Ed, God rest his soul, is, uh, no longer with us, but uh, I know I've known Lorraine for a number of years, and I've had her on the show um, back in 2001. Uh, Lorraine, uh, you know, told me about everything that had happened in the house, and she had actually, you know, spoke with Lou. I think Lou's got more audio from those interviews than anybody else in broadcast history. Mm-hmm. Lou's actually got over 40-some hours, I think, and part of the interviews that he did, he did with the DeFeo kid uh-huh. um, through the jail somehow, I believe. And he got, like, you know, the letters and stuff like that. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that he's got that's just really amazing. And I could be wrong about the, the interview with DeFeo. That may have been through through a letter that he sent to the jail that was responded to. I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's been a while. Well, correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, Jay, but DeFeo's still alive, I think. Oh, yeah, he is. He's in jail. He's still alive, and he's doing, like, six consecutive life sentences. Oh, yeah. You won't see him anytime <laughs> soon. Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, no, he's in, like, Manson, man. He ain't coming out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Manson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Manson. We'll get to that next. But anyway, um, Mayo, uh, yeah, he's he's not going. He's not going to show up at your Labor Day party anytime soon. But, oh no. Uh, uh, what was interesting, and you can almost make a movie about the two different sides: one trying to prove it, and one trying to debunk it. That went on after the Lutz is evacuated. Yeah. Which was, you know, at one point I didn't even realize this, but at one point in the special, at part two, you know, like a, you know, hundreds of people have done in-depth investigations of the situation to the point where at one point, like 15 or 16 news reporters collectively spent the night in the house to see if anything would happen. And you know what a lot of people forget, too, is that that house is lived in. Oh, it is now, yeah. Yeah, it was for, I think it has been ever since, just about. And I believe that the new owners, they even changed the uh, the windows, uh, you, you know, the, the exactly. scene. Yeah, just to, exactly. so people wouldn't they, find they, it. They, they gave the entire place a facelift because all these people bombard their neighborhood Looking for the house. Have beers in their front yard. Say, check it out. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, we're partying. You got the Amityville Whoa. house, man. Come on over. <laughs> Show me the gateway to hell, bro. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, it's on Ocean, 112 Ocean Avenue, if I'm if I'm thinking correctly. 112 Ocean Avenue, high hopes. And uh, you, you know, after you know, yeah, after that was sold, I know the owners wanted to to keep the people away, and I don't blame them. But you know, you know, uh, George Lutz, the original uh, owner at the time that all that stuff was going on. He mm-hmm. died. Uh, he died fairly recently. I think it was he last year. Because he just did an interview for this special, and it was the first one he'd done in twenty years. Yeah, well, he, he died very. It was it was about a year ago, year and a half ago. He passed away, and his wife of of, of that time, they were divorced, obviously. Um, she had died. Uh, she had passed away uh, years before that. Um, and it, it's just a really weird story, you know. And, and Are, they're both dead then. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think the kids See, are that, still alive. That doc, this documentary I've seen must have been a couple of years old because it didn't clarify that. But one thing it did say, uh, well, I'll tell you first of all, they are very convincing when you hear them talk. Now I don't know if they're convincing because you know it was Vietnam in that house or because they've had a, decades to get their story down. But <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, they are very. When you listen to them talk, they definitely strike you as someone who survived some strange happenings. And when you when you hear Lorraine talk about it, you know, um, I, I I believe that she believes what she claims to have seen or, or mm-hmm. you know felt. <clears throat> I know that uh, it's a it's an ongoing argument between her nephew John Zaffis and uh, the Taps guys. I know Jason wants to disprove that so bad he can, you know, <laughs> but uh, and they argue back and forth on whether or not it was real. And uh, you know, I believe something definitely went down in the house. I don't know what, but I mean, no one's going to go into a house at such a deal that they got it in especially in, back in the day, and then evacuate less than 30 days later. I mean, this guy had a good business that paid really well. Um, well, see, that's one side of it. Somebody else told me that their house was in foreclosure. Oh, well, there you go. Which may not entirely make sense because it happened how so can quick you, after they moved in. I was going to say, how can you be in foreclosure if you just bought but the house and moved in? One side of it is that there was some sort of economic trouble, but I don't necessarily think that, you know, 28 days into a house, you need to pull a like a... You're going to run out screaming. Type evacuation and flee. Oh, and leave all your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
granted, that only makes the story more convincing, and that may have been the point. I mean, I don't know which what to think either way. <laughs> I love the fact the book is so effective, and you just think, man. And you know the first the first movie the first movie they did was good. I liked it. As well, a see that's that's where we differ in opinion. But you also like The Exorcist too. Oh, get <laughs> off it! Anyway, I mean this is a guy who couldn't stop raving to me about Howard the Duck. <laughs> Actually, I, I did like that. Isn't film. that Spielberg's worst uh, box it office probably flop to date? Himself. <laughs> the only reason I like that movie is for one scene. Howard the Duck. Yeah, and there's a scene where it's like oh, on, we're not even actually talking about this. Are oh, we, yeah, we got. We got. I got to bring. I got to bring the scene out. With this? I've got to bring the scene out. Hey, all, all your writers are on strike anyway. I've got to bring the scene out. And they, <laughs> they were on strike too, at least mentally, when they wrote that movie. And they should be after writing that. Yeah, oh, but, uh, if they weren't fired immediately. Exactly. <laughs> terrible piece of work. And George Lucas is associated with, but no surprise. Oh, it's Lucas, not Spielberg. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Jay, what's the scene? I all right, I'm, I'm, tell us. I'm it's the one the with, with the feather condom, isn't it? Is no, it? no, no, it's not, it's it. not no, that one. No. They're in the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 they're in the, the, it just shows like it's a commercial that's on a TV behind them, and, but you get to see the whole thing. It's like the one duck's in like the, the locker room with the other duck, and he's like, the one duck's growing, and he's like, eh, eh, and he's like, Oh, you know, I can't remember the duck's name, so I'm like, John, we'll just say it's John. It's like, oh, John, what's wrong? Jock itch again. <laughs> That's like oh, dude, the brief. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really oh, funny. Guys, let me just apologize to your audience on behalf of Jay Scott for actually even wasting your time with that synopsis. That was such a terrible movie, and everyone's blocked it out of their mind. If you were even cursed with seeing so much of the trailer, and you actually had the nerve—I mean, you couldn't even effectively retell it. It's, it's hilarious. I'd rather talk about your other favorite, The Exorcist. Oh uh, yeah. But I didn't actually, I give if you, if you, I think some people should agree at least with this point. If you read the book by Jay Anson, there's no way that movie cuts it. There's yeah, you're right. No way you're the right. Initial Amityville horror cuts it because that book, well they were all upset about about the way the movie came out all the people yeah everyone was and it obviously so the book is just so remarkable and but i'm it, i'm i'm comparing the original to that crappy trashy remake they made a few years oh, ago we don't let's let's just forget that happened yeah no, it I was still, bad you know that was the one movie in recent history that i not only asked for my money back before the movie was over but i asked for additional money for damages at the box office <laughs> i was so offended i was like not only do i want my ticket price back but you need to triple up on it <laughs> because I've just wasted, you know, 45 minutes of, of my, my life. life. It's unwatchable. <laughs> but the whole thing, I mean, the first, people do have a certain admiration for that first movie, although I, it never really, it's not really regarded in my household as a classic. I just, the book is just remarkable, and they've never really, in all the attempts at making those movies, they never nailed that book, any aspect of that book, squarely on the head. I mean, that, what, what's, your, what's your favorite horror movie, Ethan? I know we've talked about this before, but I don't remember. Well, the original Exorcist, not okay. your favorite, the sequel. But the You're original, so wrong. That's, that's <laughs> one of my favorites. I also like Robert Wise's version of The Haunting. You know, Hooper's ex Poltergeist is pretty good. Yeah, yeah that is decent. a pretty good film. You know, the original Omen. Yeah, yeah. Fright, know, I mean, Fright Night. Fright Night's a good movie. I'd What's put that? that up. Fright Night. Yeah, you like Fright Night a lot. That's true. That's true. Uh, that's a good film. You didn't like you it? Know, you're entitled to like that, Jay. Are we gonna, we're gonna bore your audience with a clip from Fright Night, just like we did with Howard the Duck. Cause you're actually, we're on double probation tonight. Oh, I'm on super top secret double probation. <laughs> yeah. Did you ask? Did you ask um, Jay when he was on what his favorite horror movie is? Um, no, I didn't. He he would get way into that. Talk about a guy that's great to talk to. I remember he's one of the few people recently I had dinner with. <laughs> who told me how he became an Oakland Raiders fan by playing the Madden video game in England. Oh That's gosh. hilarious. <laughs> and I was like, That's weird. I was like, talk about video game culture, like achieving new success. <laughs> well, did, didn't NFL Europe tank this last year? <laughs> uh, he, he's a diehard Raider fan, and I'm like, wait a minute, man, you're living in some London suburb, and he's a fan because of the Madden game. Remarkable. But That's great hilarious. But to talk to, and definitely one of the more talented musicians you'll come across. Weird. <laughs> that? I said weird. Well, it's the other kind of football over there too, man. And you say football over there, I think you're talking about soccer. That's right. The soccer well, I mean, hooligan is strange. He's a big soccer fan, but he's also a big American football fan, obviously. Raiders of all people. And I said, man, you know, when the Raiders <laughs> moved from my town, L.A., back to Oakland, the crime rate went down. <laughs> I, like, I don't doubt it. That's like, how right. fast can we get rid of these criminals? Take the black hole up north. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't drive across town on a Sunday because every hood 
within the L.A. County area was out and, and tailgating. <laughs> I heard you had, um, I got a phone call from another interesting character we know, uh, Dr. James Stevenson. Yes. How was he? He was great. Yeah, he is great, isn't he? He's the guy with the guitar. Chuck's looking at me like, what? He's the guy that plays guitars for Gino Chuck, Jezebel. Chuck, oh, okay. To, let me bring you up to speed, Chuck, on your own guest list. Okay? <laughs> yeah, no, Chuck, Chuck actually... I'm filling in, man. Chuck actually had a good conversation with him that yeah, night. Yeah, actually, we were talking about his collection. Yeah, because Chuck no. plays guitar, you know. He's, he's got a remarkable a, history that guy's got. You know, Generation X with Billy Idol. You know, he told yeah. me a very funny story, you know, and... Uh, I don't know if he told it to you, but we were laughing about it over some beers the other night. He was telling me a story about when he started out with this group called Chelsea prior to him playing with Billy Idol. You know, um, Miles Copeland managed him with, along with the police in Squeeze. Huh. And at one point he goes in, right, it's like the mid-70s, and James Stevenson goes in and says, Miles, I need a new amp. And the accountant says, hey, you know, forget it, forget it, James, you ain't getting anything, you're... You're on pro no money for you. <laughs> and James's comeback was, hey, listen, man, if I don't get a, an amp, you know, I can't play effectively. I got to have my I got to have my tools, you know. And he's like, well, listen, we can't afford it right now. And so James comes back and he goes, listen. And he says something to the effect. He goes, look, all right, I understand you managing us and this band squeeze, but the police, come on, they'll never amount to anything. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. And I told him, I said, you know, but... but James, given his nature, you know, the way he tells it is he always, you know, he's got a very good sense of humor about himself. So when he tells it, I was like, James, that's got to be, you got to put that in your book, man. That's, that's, one of the, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And he just like said something like, come on, this guy Sting, who the hell does he think he is? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, what happened to Chelsea and Squeeze? None of us know. Of course not. <laughs> what happened yeah, to but, Sting? Well, we all know. <laughs> but Steven, Stevenson himself, man, had a bright career, and he's a bright guy. He's a, I'm glad he was on your show because he's a blast to talk to. Oh, yeah, definitely. And those two guys <laughs> together, Jay Anson and, and James Stevenson, you know, look out. <laughs> but, you know, alert your local authorities, because those guys, <laughs> it's like the British rebel, the British invasion all over again. I could I could not imagine both of those guys in the same room, man. It would be crazy. <laughs> you know, it would be nice if we had them on now. We could ask them what they think about Amityville Horror, and they'd probably go on and on. <laughs> you know, that's one of those topics you can get them going on, and they'll just talk about it all night, man. I mean, but I'll tell you this, you know, it was fascinating. I... Since I read the book, I didn't really look into the mystery about who says what, but it was fascinating to to to, to see that stuff, man. And I knew you could, you know, I mentioned it out here, and people are like, "What? Are you are you serious? You're trying to talk to us about that?" But you guys are you guys are definitely in the loop. You know the DeFeo case and all that, and it's just oh, it's good you know, stuff. It's very interesting. Well, Ethan, Ethan, we, I hate to cut you off. We're gonna have to take a break, though. Yeah, screw you guys. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, hang with us, guys, and uh, we'll, we'll open up the phones a little later because we've got a special guest coming up. But yeah. uh, <laughs> hang tight, and we'll be right back on World of the Unexplained. Ronnie DeFeo from jail. That's right. <laughs> In just a bit. Uh, this is World of the Unexplained. I'm Trent Lackey. Anyway, uh, tonight we got Ethan Dettenmeyer and uh, also Dennis Storhoy. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Um, Dennis was in the 13th, 13th Warrior. Warrior. Yes. Dennis, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for pronouncing my name so right. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, good. excellent. Okay, excellent. okay. Good. worried about that. You guys passed the first test. For those of us who don't know, <laughs> yeah. Dennis is on the line from Norway where they're nine hours ahead. Yeah, so he's a real so trooper. Yeah, we appreciate it. He just walked out of the pub long enough to talk to us. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> he's still in the pub now. No, <laughs> he's on his way to the pub. No, We're in between pubs. Cool. But you know, the bottom um, line is, uh, you know, for those of you, those in the audience who, who, those in your audience, Jay, who might not know, be immediately familiar with Dennis's work. He did make the movie Thirteenth Warrior as the primary Viking opposite Antonio Banderas, and he is the movie. The movie, he absolutely, his performance absolutely makes the movie. I to agree. Kind of bring yeah, I, I totally agree. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you so much. And you know what? I'm not even lying. I mean, that's that is the truth. No, it, it absolutely <laughs> is. So how, how was how was working in that film for you, Dennis? It was great. Uh, he's uh, a little bit younger than me. Uh huh. Fourteen days. Well, okay. Wow. No. Fourteen uh -huh. days. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did, he's fourteen days younger than me. 
No, what and is... uh, he's from Spain and uh, he's European and he was, uh, you know, spending time in the makeup uh, chair for uh, half a year. <laughs> long time. So, so where, where, now where did they shoot a lot of this stuff at? Uh, sorry? Where did they film a lot of this at? Uh, Some place called Campbell River in uh, Canada. Okay, it's beautiful, beautiful scenery. Yeah, it was. It was. I mean, it was um, uh, what we called it uh, in kind of um, Norway in uh, animal steroids. Oh, <laughs> Norway animal <laughs> steroids. Okay. <laughs> well, what, what, what well, the location? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, I mean, the most beautiful country. Yeah, and uh, the scenery was totally uh, so great. You were you were a scary guy in that film. <laughs> yes, really. I mean, that you know when we saw that movie, um, and we, we were looking at your character, I was like, now that dude is is a very scary guy. That that guy's a real man. <laughs> That's what we said when yeah, we like saw that, you that, on that, there. That first scene when you, you think so? Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, we where Antonio Banderas walks into the, the the hall or whatever, and some guy tries to jump you, I guess, and like you drop him and like well, you know, two swipes. I was <laughs> like. Best. Dennis has got the best line in the movie, which is, uh, you know, do we have a plan? And Dennis's response is, we're just going to ride till we find them and kill them all. <laughs> exactly. yeah. I don't know how many days I've walked into Warner Brothers and said, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to go in that conference room, and anyone who gives us any, we're going to kill them all. <laughs> but, I mean, all the best you dialogue still, you was... Still, uh, you, still, you still don't got the best lines, actually. <laughs> what's, what's, your, uh, what's your favorite line from the piece, Dennis? Well, the, the favorite lines is... Um, it's not in the movie. Oh. But do you remember the, when we're going to uh, try to kill the bad guys uh, in this cave? Uh-huh. And uh, John McTune said, I-, I have to write some new lines for you. It, I know it was stolen from the Maverick movie. You know, with uh, Mel Gibson. Gibson? Yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah. So we were actually, I mean, we did the stunts. Oh, it was really? waterfall, and it was uh, in Norwegian terms 40 meters down. Oh my gosh! And I tell you guys, I was so scared. It looked, and, it didn't look uh, like you were. <laughs> well, we had a harness, we had everything, and the guy from the top said, Oh, well, Mr. Banderas going out, this story is going out. And the lines were like this I say to Antonio, What is it? And he says, I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> you say you're afraid I of say, heights? Uh, I say, listen, the scalded eagle has three toes. Pause. What does that mean? Nothing. And he sounds. <laughs> 40 meters actually down there in the harness and uh, through the waterfalls and everything. Well, you'll, you'll have to wait to catch that one on the director's cut. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure a lot yeah, of this I is there. So. I hope so. But John was really satisfied, and he, John McTee, the director, he was so satisfied afterwards and said, Oh, wow, that was a really great scene. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, we had a lot of fun. But you had a chance, in, a, in addition to working with Banderas, Dennis, you were you had a chance to exchange words with Omar Sharif. Yes. Huh. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, since I love uh, movies and I've always been uh, watching movies from the world since I was a young kid, I had the chance to, to be together with uh, Mr. Sharif for many days. And he was actually the one who took the English, uh, what do you call, said, do you like sushi story? No. I said, I never tasted it. Okay. And uh, I liked it. Oh. And then we talked about movies for uh, nine days, I think, and uh, in the end I had to tell him that, uh, Mr. Sharif, um, I have to go up every wait in the morning, five o'clock, <laughs> and be treated with you to four o'clock. It's, uh, you know, no. I have to sleep sometime. Yeah. But it was so many great <laughs> stories from this guy. Wow. He's a great actor.
That's amazing. Yeah, yeah one of the best, no doubt. Certainly. I mean, Lawrence of Arabia is all you really need to see if you want to see him have a command performance. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. you know, who can blame you, Dennis, for staying up till 4 o'clock with that guy? Yeah, yeah definitely. Really. No. I'm surprised the director didn't roll your call time back a little bit and cut you some slack. No, but he was <laughs> telling me about, you know, when uh, Peter O'Toole and he did that movie, uh, Omar was so afraid of camels. Really? <laughs> so he asked the prop guys, do you have a rope? Because the riding on camels is not the same as riding on horses. Yeah. So um, nobody knew, but he got the prop guys to tie him properly <laughs> on the camel. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> camel? <laughs> Tied and Peter again. too, who was not quite as sober as uh, <laughs> nobody at that time, right. asked Omar, "How, how, how can you sit so <laughs> straight upright on this camel?" Because <laughs> <laughs> there's a liability out there. <laughs> Omar just lifted up his uh, costume, and it was just ropes all over him. I said, "Fine," and Peter too said. Yes, and <laughs> then they made this great movie when they ride as hell through the. They were both tied. They were both. <laughs> They're both tied up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, you know, knows. I don't think I've heard that story anywhere else. I don't think I have no, either. No, no. But it makes perfect sense because, man, they are good on those camels. They are. <laughs> they are. The magic I mean, of Hollywood. Point, they're like going full throttle. <laughs> Then you know why I was sitting up with Mr. Omar Sharif. Yeah. <laughs> Listening to a lot of stories I can't tell you now, but uh, maybe later. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what, what are you working on right now, Dennis? Uh, these days I'm doing a, a kind of a television movie in Norway. Okay. Hmm. And I'm working with... Uh, Per Gint, if you heard about Ibsen. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't get any of that, Dennis. Yeah, I, um, I didn't either. What, what's the what's the what's the English version of that name? Uh, Henrik Ibsen. Henry. Gibson. Oh, the playwright. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've heard of Henrik Ibsen. Right. Yeah, he's written a lot of plays. That uh, I mean, in the states, he's uh, performed every day. I think oh, wow. in all stage work. Dennis was actually up to be Silius in uh, the Da Vinci Code, but passed on it to do Death of the, Stales, Death of the Salesman on, on the stage. Really? So oh, that, wow. That's, that's a man dedicated to his craft mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, and, that, and that's such a great, uh, Death of the Salesman is such a great play. Oh, it certainly is. But yeah, that's the, the Da Vinci Code. Code. I mean, the Da Vinci Code. chance of a lifetime. But to pass on Da Vinci yeah. Code to do it, that's, that's a real <laughs> love for performing right Yeah, now. wow. Yeah. So do you, do you have any American films that you're working on uh, coming soon or anything like that? Hell, yes, he does. Well, oh, you sorry. have to ask <laughs> actually. Well, I knew that. I was just prompting you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is where we got to tell the audience that we, uh, we, we have had talks before we went on the air about yeah. what's cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Dennis is playing a mercenary for me early next year. Okay. He's a specialist with a crossbow, and he's playing a character out of South Africa. Oh, that'd be cool. And awesome. if anyone has, can recall his work in the Thirteenth Warrior, you know we cast this movie right. Yes, yes, mm. definitely, definitely. Now, when is when is this? When, when are you going to start shooting this? We're supposed to go into production in March. We're in pre-production now, actually. Dennis is coming stateside early next month to kind of hammer some things out. But he is ideally the type of person we strive to work with i mean both in talent and as a person you know first class individual all around and i would say that even if he wasn't on the air with us <laughs> but seriously he's quite the performer and he's exactly the type of person i mean jay we've been on i've been on the show enough with you to know for you to know what kind of people <laughs> oh, yeah. we respond to and like to work with and dennis fits you know we'd like to use the right kind of cast and crew and bulletproof personalities who can deliver and that's where dennis fits in so what 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 bring, what brought you away from the stage and back into the American uh, American films, Dennis? What what? Well, if you listen to my accent, uh -huh. then you can hear the actually a Norwegian accent, don't uh -huh. you? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Oh yeah. 
So it's uh, it's a kind of a sp- um, doing a South African uh, guy it would be uh, really great, but I have to work on uh, I have to have a dialogue coach. Yeah. Mm. But what what what, what but what made what made you decide to, to to come back to American films after being on the stage and doing a lot of things in in your country? The director, the director okay. did it. <laughs> you yeah, you work with the always, director. It's, it's always uh, uh, always telling a story, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's why we choose to, uh, as Ethan, the director. I'm an actor, and we just choose to tell the best story. Awesome, awesome, yeah. Okay. Aren't you playing a killer right now, uh, Dennis? Isn't that what yeah, you do in I Norway? Do. You're playing like a serial murderer. Yeah, I do. Wow. Oh. But it's but one of those debonair know, uh, type murderers that you love, isn't it? No, but it's kind of uh, when people ask if you. Sometimes um, I did um, uh, a stage play, like a Chauffeur, if you heard of that. Mm-hmm. That's called in the American Birdcage. Yeah. Or, you remember um, the movie? Yeah. Birdcage. Yeah. I'm trying to. And I had to uh, portrait this guy who is a drag queen. Oh, I know oh, what you're talking cage, about. The birdcage, right, right. yeah, okay. Robin Williams yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah. that other guy. Right. So Nathan, it's right. kind of a um, different story than doing 13 Warrior yeah. to <laughs> play a woman. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I bet so. 100 performances, uh, so half man, half woman. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I had to do some research to see some clubs around Europe and um, to, to learn how to behave like a woman. <laughs> You're a lot braver than I am, man. Yeah. That's more yeah. than playing a serial killer because as an actor, I don't have to kill anybody <laughs> to behave like a serial killer. Well, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, it's a good thing you don't have to really live that part. <laughs> but uh, I tell you, it was, I mean, it was difficult to portray a woman. Yeah, I believe it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially yeah, seeing some of the work you've done elsewhere. Yeah, I think uh, that kind of job was uh, interesting, actually. Yeah. Because I had to, every day before performance, I just uh, I had to oil my nails. Yeah. <laughs> I had to wear stay-ups, and, uh, <laughs> you know, it was... <laughs> I was doing it another series in television at that time, playing a, um, doing a lawyer. Watch and, out! Uh, <laughs> the director said to me after three months, he said to me, "You know, you're looking like a woman now. Straighten up, be a man." <laughs> <laughs> hey, not to sound like James Lipton here, but that's that's a true professional who puts that kind of research into their performance. You don't hear that very often. That's certainly not the popular way to do things with American actors. Well, definitely not. No, certainly not. <laughs> well, guys, we're coming up on our on our break again. So, okay. um, well, Ethan is not going to cost me this time. I think. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are you talking about, man? We'll get into that after the break. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, guys, hang tight with us. We're going to be back in in about five minutes. All right. Okay, but can you do me a favor? Sure. Please turn up the. Uh, I uh, you, I don't hear you so much from now. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll work we'll, on. We'll it. work on that. All right, we'll be yeah. back in just a second after this. And we're back, World of the Unexplained. Tonight we have Ethan Dettenmeyer and Dennis Storhoy uh, from the Thirteenth Warrior. Uh, Dennis, what was your favorite scene from the movie The Thirteenth Warrior? Oh, that was. Um I guess the scene that, um... Come on, Dennis, when you walked out of the tent with the two babes. <laughs> oh, yeah, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> when you walked out of the tent with the two girls. <laughs> you know, Harry was the guy who was always together with two girls. <laughs> and that's, that's why I'm an actor, because uh, in the real life, you can never do that. It's four, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> You know how the Norwegians do it. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's, uh, well, the casting was great, I tell you. Yeah, the casting um, is excellent in that movie, no joke. <laughs> it's, you know, it's so strange between all these guys from Scotland and Wales and uh, Denmark, Sweden, 
you know, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, strange people living through the half a year. Did everyone speak English on the set, Dennis, or did you guys have to do some of your lines phonetically? Well, I started to, we had some boot camp. And right. And we, they tried to learn us the Oh, really? Oh. Did they have to teach you how to use yeah. the sword and all that and ride the horse, or did you have a grip on all that stuff? Yeah, we ride horses. We uh, had, uh, you know, sword fights, uh, uh, everything. But the best thing of it was that they brought in a lady from Latvia who had lived in Sweden for um, three years with a man, and she was going to learn us Norwegian. And I'm actually from Norway. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you had a grip on that part of it. Well, uh, <laughs> you know the guys, it's so funny to be on a boot camp with all these guys from everywhere in the world, and they are going to learn a week. Yeah. They didn't learn anything. <laughs> 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 only, only the bad words. Only the bad well, words. <laughs> that's pretty true with any kind of foreign language you, you pick up that's originally. That's the first thing. Yeah, you learn the all the bad words first. But, I mean, if you look at the yeah. movie... Sorry. Look at the uh, if you look at the movie, Dennis. You're on a horse. You kill a guy with a lance. You use a bow and arrow. You have to use a sword. You have to swim. Go over a waterfall. <laughs> mm. I mean, if I'm your agent on that, I'm thinking big deal. I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking that's a pretty action-packed movie for an actor to go through. So it's no joke that they ran you through a boot camp where you guys would all get to kind of know each other a little bit better and practice with all that stuff. Because there's some dangerous stunt work in that movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know this. Uh, if you remember the the guy, I. Um the red-haired guy. Yeah. I take the head off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Uh huh. Yeah, we remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You take his head off in the duel. Yeah. Yeah. It was this one of these uh, scenes where, well, he I'm supposed to be you know uh, beaten up. Right. And uh, once the scenes really with really swords, and he didn't hear the word. Cut. So I loved my God, and uh, he hit my hand so badly. I was I was blue. He broke my really my fist. Oh. Uh, so yeah. So the director yells cut, right? And yeah, we hope. <laughs> he didn't hear it. Oh. So yeah, that's um, good. That was that was uh, interesting to. You know, doing sword fights with uh, no hand, actually, mm. <laughs> because That's it was broken. But uh, you know, hey, you know, you just you got to play through that kind of thing, right? Oh man. Your bottom line is the, dr the director should have hired a stunt crew or a fighting crew that actually spoke the same language he does. Oh yeah. Mm, when you mm -hmm. cut, the guy knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> like, what? what? What's that? Oh, okay. No. Yeah. All right, we'll keep shooting. Well, you know, that's, a, that's another great moment for you in the movie, Dennis, because you get a chance. You know, Banderas is all concerned about you, and you're just like, "Hey, we'll bet on him if you like." <laughs> yeah. You know, he's like, that guy's pretty big, and you're like, "We'll bet on him if you want." <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Engineering I, dispute. I, I, I give all the credits to to uh, John McTee because he was always. So concerned about uh, me doing, you know, whatever you like. Yeah. And the best lines was, I mean, uh, it was for me a kind of dream to read the script. Uh, it was kind of, uh, it's kind of winning in a lot of coming from Norway, you know, and actually do a part like that. Well, I mean, it's probably a dream come true, you being from Norway and getting to play a Viking in a movie yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, talk about being in touch with your heritage. Let me ask you this. This always interests me as a filmmaker um, and for the audience that may have followed the movie. That movie's pretty notorious for going through some studio changes when it was wrapped. After McTiernan wraps his cut, McTiernan, mm -hmm. as you know, directed Die Hard and whatnot. Then Crichton, Michael Crichton, the writer behind Jurassic Park and other books, he had written the book Eaters of the Dead, and I guess that, Dennis, can you take us through the situation where they did the title change, and he came in and he directed additional scenes and basically took the movie over? Yeah, I, I, actually, I'm so glad I don't know so much about that story. <laughs> hmm. 
actually. Uh, yeah. I know it was a, I know they have some things uh, behind the scenes that actually I don't know. But uh, if uh, Mr. John McTiernan uh, makes the director's cut, as I know he wants the job to be, mm. I would be really pleased. Cool. Mm. Just based on some of our conversations, Dennis, there's a ton of that movie that has been cut out. Oh, that yeah, there's yeah. basically an epic film somewhere in somebody's garage yeah. that we're hoping the studio will release as John McTiernan's director's cut. Because I know you and I have talked about this movie in the past quite a bit, Dennis, over, you know, the time we've known each other and some of the things you've told me some of the more interesting aspects of the film actually were cut in an attempt to sort of speed the the, the running time up huh. well you... i uh, i know that we i mean you don't work with a movie for six months uh in a desert uh in a lot of scenes that we we did actually was about the difference between an arab and the Scandinavian call it the Viking culture mm -hmm. so that was the point from John McTiernan as I uh, know when we worked that the the cultural aspect was so important for him but uh, the movie now uh, is it's more like uh, you know I think it uh I told before that it's it's not the movie we worked on it was cut to make money for another purpose right oh, I yeah. agree with you you can see yeah. that when you mm. see the movie too you can see that it's been yeah, it's been cut so sort of sort of in a way to expedite it to an audience what a uh, what kind of a uh, material would you have liked to have seen? remain in the film that got cut out, Dennis. Um, Listening, the cultural difference. Uh, I, yeah, but I, I, right. That's where you get back on the Howard the Duck subject. Oh, no, that was, that was Trent. That he, wasn't he me. He totally missed it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I obviously yeah, did. I uh, just wanted, like, some, some finer details, I guess, you know. Um, well, we're now talking about, uh, I think it's ten years since I shot the movie, and it's a long time. Right. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, um, it's so many things that my... Uh, other colleagues, um, Tony Curran, uh, you have other actors from, uh, I mean, did great jobs. Yeah, I agree that it's, yeah. it's, it's so a well-performed movie. It's, it's not just about me, uh, not just about Antonio. Uh, although, I mean, Antonio did a great job because he was actually playing... Uh, uh, what do you call the status under us? And think about uh, Mr. Banderas, who is a big star, uh, making a movie with um, nobody, actually, mm -hmm. and really doing, in all respect, doing his best job, I think, because he was, uh, he was uh, acting with uh, people, nobody acting. Actually, and well, you really did did a great job. I understand why you use the term nobody, and from a big screen standpoint, it's tough to recognize the resumes of the actors involved. But I would definitely say that the Vikings were really well cast, and, Inter and Banderas really does do a good job of playing a guy who's trying to adapt and find his way amongst people who already know combat and know how to battle. You know, uh, the you know the the you know, who know the land and 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 know the sword play and I think that he does do a decent job at that. I mean, Dennis, let me ask you I this: so. How do you feel when you watch the movie today? What goes through your mind? I miss the guys. You miss the guys? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I do. Huh. Do you keep in touch with the cast? Uh, sorry. Do you keep in touch with them? Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Every time I have a chance, uh, but you know. Uh, Norway is so far north up, you know, so most of the time I work uh, stage playing, movies, television, radio, things. So it's, it's, it's not so easy because the, also the time level is, you know, so strong. But do, you, do you live in the part of Norway where it's like dark 30 days in a row? No, 29. 
Oh, oh, okay. That's not so bad then. I mean, re real quick, getting back to the movie real fast. Uh, do you, did you did you have a good experience with both John McTiernan and Michael Crichton? I mean, did you work well with those guys? Uh, I must say that um, Michael Crichton. I, I I'm so sorry. He was so interested in horses, and uh, he has a lot of contact with some kind of um, horses around the world. Yeah. Uh, between his writing and he was a great man but I have to tell you that Mr. John McTiernan was um, for me a great experience hmm. huh. So Crichton's a big equestrian? Well Crichton came in in the end and I, I'm, I didn't get too well known with him now, that shot in the end of the movie, that's something that Michael Crichton did after photography wrapped, right? He wanted to do a thing where you said goodbye and, like, you were already sent home, right? And didn't he recall you or bring you back to do the scene on the boat? Yeah. Where you say goodbye or, you know, mm -hmm. get the hell out of here or whatever it is you say to Banderas at the end of the movie? Because that, that does feel like an additional scene when you watch it. It feels like it's tacked on in a way. It is. Yeah. How does the movie? How did how did John McTiernan's version of the movie end? Do you live? Do you get killed? No, he gets killed. I think he. Uh, I, I think Herger is the guy that, you know, the um, intention of Herger was uh, like a Viking that the death is always the best part of life. Mm -hmm. So he would uh, never marry or never. Uh, get into anything else than fighting, drinking. You know what I mean? Oh, huh. yeah. That was that was the purpose of her fighting and drinking. Michael huh? Crichton wrote it, and I did it, and uh, it was kind of uh, interesting to to a character that never is afraid of death. If you know what I mean. Yeah, well, that's one of the heroic aspects of the movie is that the characters are all very cavalier about meeting their own death, whether it's, you know, the Neanderthals ripping their head off or however they all meet it. But it's that's one of the things, I think, that's one of the aspects of Viking culture that the movie really gets across well, that the whole point of life is to eventually die with a sword in your hand and reach Valhalla. Yeah, yeah but they had this attitude that uh, as I also tell uh, in lines to to Antonio, who says, "Skein of life, your destiny is already made." Yeah, you say that in the film. You tell him at one point when he's scared that you know your destiny yeah. is already written. Yeah, it is. But you know, just that uh, mentality, these guys, from from uh, where I come from, it's kind of. Um, strange living in the old days that people actually thought that way yeah but it, it's a real good way to simplify your life in a way when you just when you embrace the fact that I die Tuesday I die Thursday it makes no difference there's nothing I can do to prevent that and it's almost like a way for the warrior to live at peace but the movie gets that philosophy I think the book does too yeah and Crichton's book gets that I think that's very well lifted from the page but, I mean, the cast, the cast really does bring those characters to life. The film underachieved here in the States, but I think you cannot, you can't watch the movie today and not be, as a director or a filmmaker, be overwhelmed by the performances in the movie because you can understand somewhat the conditions the movie was made under. And, yeah. uh, you know, whether it's you speaking Greek to Norwegian to however you do the translating in the beginning to the other actors getting tattooed or doing the boot camp it's very there's some impressive performances Dennis and you should be regardless of how the movie was received you should be pretty proud of what you did there thank you so much definitely yeah I agree <clears throat> and Dennis th thanks for coming on the show tonight we appreciate having you on I know it's I know it's very late pleasure to talk with you actually it's only four in the morning there, Dennis. You have time to catch a cab ride home from the pub. <laughs> Do you want to leave us with any... Come on, leave us with some parting words. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can do the... Um, what you forgot about the last line I had. All right. We okay. shall make praise for your safe passage. 
but I can do it as uh, Sean Connery as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's hear it. We shall make praise for your safe passage. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome now, that's oh, that's awesome. Anywhere else, a Norwegian <laughs> actor doing Sean Connery. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> how uh, how multicultural so, can we get? <laughs> so, so be so glad I, I don't speak like him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we ruined your uh, mics. <laughs> you know, it's funny, I talked to Dennis, I talked to production contacts in Finland, Germany, Japan, and then I talked to guys out of Scotland like Connery, and for some reason, I can understand all these guys out of Scandinavia and Germany better than the land where they're supposedly speak English. <laughs> <laughs> these Scottish guys start talking, and I'm like, wait a minute, whoa, whoa. Slow down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was mine. Dennis, it's a blast to talk to you, man. I'm glad you're doing well. Give my best to your family. I will, and you too. I'll talk to you tomorrow, probably. Good. All right. Thank you so much for thank you again, Dennis. Dennis. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right, and that was Dennis Storhoy from the Straight Out of Norway Thirteenth Warrior. Yeah. Thanks so much for hooking that up. Yeah, that, that was, was good stuff. So that guy, quality. So he's a class act, man. He's very, very. He's very good in that movie, and he's a good guy to know. I mean, in general, it is true. Ron <laughs> Howard hired him to be serious and. Uh, Da Vinci Code, and he passed on it because he wanted to do Death of the Salesman. And for some people sitting at home, they may not understand that, but for a real performer, I mean, that shows you the guy's dedication. I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's a pretty pretty good choice. I mean, Death of the Salesman. It's you a know, great it's a, choice. It's, it's a, a great classic, choice. classic. And, uh, you know, Da Vinci Code is a pretty good book, and it was an all right movie and all, but, you know. But a lot of those no name actors that were in it, even the, uh, I, I, who was the woman that co starred in it? I don't know. I, I don't think she's gotten uh, any play out of that no. film. The thing about it is no. um, that, you know, a lot of people would have strove for the Da Vinci Code, reestablish yourself after Get the, the name, get the face out there. What's that? And get the name and get the face out yeah, there. You know, he had taken a hiatus after 13th Warrior. Come back, do the Da Vinci Code, get the money that the Da Vinci Code gives you and connect with Ron Howard. A lot of people would have done that. But for, you know, he's one of those true performers where you can say, listen, man, you can play Celius or you can play Death of a Salesman in a local stage theater in front of 15 people. And he will genuinely, because of what Death of the Salesman gives him as a performer, take oh, yeah. that. Yeah. And that's, that to me is very respectable because I'm just. I'm surrounded by corporate Nazi sellouts out here, so I think it's all. It sounds like it. We can hear airplanes. I, I, I flying think I can over. hear a Stuka out there. Actually, actually, Ethan, maybe there's a Stuka somewhere. You, you might want to get some cover. What's that? What are you talking about? We're hearing what the airplane. Making, we're hearing out there, man. <laughs> we're hearing the airplanes. What? Airplanes. We hear what? airplanes. What? It, it, you're, it, wherever you're talking to us from on the phone, we hear airplanes going oh, by. Oh, do you? Yeah. Diving sounds it, like. It sounds like they're diving to bomb you. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. My, I keep my beer cooler outside. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Okay, I'll go back in where you can hear me. No, 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 no. That's you're, fine. You're fine. Actually, we can hear totally fine. It was just you were talking about Nazis and, uh, you know, and uh, <laughs> dive bombers, yeah, you know. Have a couple of, as soon as I have a couple of beers in, we start using terms like Nazis, corporate evil emperor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It all you know, goes downhill you know, from here. Maybe possibly the man. You want to talk a little up. about Lionsgate then while you're at it? <laughs> talk about a, a little bit about what? Lionsgate. Lionsgate. <laughs> Lionsgate. Let's just talk about something more fun. We can either shift back to Howard the Duck and please Jay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys were talking about Howard the Duck. Yeah, you missed yeah, it, man. Oh, no, no, something no. Else your audience should probably know in regards to Dennis is that guy just <laughs> recently learned to speak English. So he did pretty damn good. Yeah, he did for, very well, very well. Yeah, I mean, he... Uh, and the Sean Connery, what, what's up with you and your friends and impersonations of other actors? It's weird. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a running theme, really. Because <laughs> you've, got, you've got the Steven Seagal thing down. <laughs> Uh, you want to die? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a great Steven Seagal story. Not from when I worked with him, but from when a partner of mine was shooting a movie for him as a DP. Steven Seagal, you know, um, <clears throat> apparently he had some issues about his weight on the set. No. No. <laughs> no. And the way they were shooting the film was if he'd walk in through a door, that there'd be like a computer monitor on a desk blocking him from like the, the chest down. Or he'd hold a phone. That's hilarious. Did I, tell this story? Did I already tell this story? I, I think I, you, I've, I've, I've heard it. No, no, I've heard it, but you, I I haven't you heard told it off. Yeah, I think you told okay. it off so air. He'd, like, he'd walk.
walk in holding a file in front of him or all the obvious tricks, you know, to hide. You know, don't get on the Stairmaster, Steve. Cut <laughs> it down. We'll block we, it out. Gimmicks. We'll just <laughs> constantly put things in front of your midsection. <laughs> it's like they do with the pregnant women on sitcoms. It's yeah. terrible. <laughs> well, the thing about it is anybody else would have said, all right, uh, you start in three weeks. Why don't you work out or jog? But with him, it's like, position the monitor. And- <laughs> Anyway, so he's doing all this stuff, these gimmicks, holding the file in front of him. And then, of course, during dailies, you know, Seagal, Seagal tells the DP, he goes, you're making me look fat. <laughs> and the DP goes, I, I'm making you look, look, no offense, Stephen, but you're, you're a pretty heavy guy. It's not, Steven it's Seagal not. takes a nice long pause and goes, do you want to die? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, does this shirt make me look fat? No, it's not the shirt that makes you look fat. It's, it's the, the fat that makes you look fat. One time when I was working on this abominable snowman project, with them, which actually, in sort of a Roger Corman kind of way, kicked ass. It was not a, it was not an epic film by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a pretty fun kind of action film for, for what it was. It was a work for hire, so I didn't have a lot of say once I came up with the initial idea, but... It was pretty fun, and I go down to the set to see him, and he's uh, he's at Civil Brand Penitentiary, a closed prison where they're shooting this other movie. I show up to have a conversation with him about the script, and his assistant comes running out and goes, Steven's still on the set. Ethan, why don't you run into his trailer and relax, get yourself something to eat, hang out, and he'll be with you as soon as possible. So I go into Seagal's trailer, and I'm, like, shuffling around looking for a beer or something to eat. And all of a sudden, he comes in, and he's wearing, like, this white doctor's coat. You have told this one before. Yeah. <laughs> but it's all right. It's a great story. Yeah, it well, is this, a good story. <laughs> Tell it again. This, is, this actually shows something of the human side to him. His reputation is not probably as good as it could be. But, you know, I tell this story, and people do s- tend to identify with the human aspect of his personality. Because he's not all bad. At least in my experience with him, I always <laughs> got along with him. Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone had horror stories, but I constantly remind people, I always got along with him. Yeah, he'd call me at one in the morning with his bright ideas and whatnot, but he was always pretty polite. But here I am in his trailer, right? I'm shopping around, going, getting, trying to get something to eat, and he walks in. He's got this, like, <laughs> white lab coat on, yeah. <laughs> and he's got, like, a name badge on it. And the, the name is, the badge has got his picture, and it says, like, Dr. Thompson on it or something. <laughs> and I just, like, refocused on that. I was like, what, Do- doctor? They got you playing a doctor in this movie? <laughs> and he's like, he just goes, Criminal psychologist, okay. <laughs> I like, I immediately, like you know, I was like, Stephen, let's get back to what we know, man. Let's do what made us. Let's do, let's do what we're good at, man. You know. And he's like, let's, I'm like, let's kick some ass. He goes, You're... he goes, I kick plenty of ass in this movie. <laughs> you know, I'm just sitting there going, but I mean, I tell that story because, like, I mean, here I am. I'm like, they got you playing a doctor, man, and he, you know, it's like, you know, a lot of other people tell the story differently. Like, he cracked him when he said that. But, you know, I mean, I had my moments with the guy where, you know, he was, he would honestly be about well, whatever the list of shortcomings is on him, and there's a long one, you know, and there's a long one on me too. I'm not really fit to talk about anyone else because if you want to talk about the stuff I do wrong, we're going to be here a long time. <laughs> But the truth is, 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 is in, in terms of my relationship with him and the limited basis I worked with him, you know, he was always a pretty decent guy. And, and I did not see any evidence of the horrible rap he has kind of amassed for himself. And I've had moments like that where he's walked in and I'd be like, oh, come on, man. Let's stop putting me on with this crap. Oh, I, play, I kick plenty of ass. <laughs> and if you don't watch it, you're next. <laughs> you know? Uh, he didn't say that part, but, you know, <laughs> it's fun to fabricate it. Okay, let's get off that topic. Sounds a little like a Brando impression, actually. <laughs> well, you know, honestly, my Seagal impression used to be a lot better when I worked meaner. more often. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of been a while now. I, I haven't heard him in a while, but, you know, usually yeah. when I do the impression, I don't say anything. I just break a bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's my impression. There you have Hold it. a file folder in front of you. Just walk <laughs> Stand behind a laptop. And whenever anyone says anything, no matter how polite, I just say, do you want to die? <laughs> <laughs> Got to have that pause there in the beginning, you know? Yeah. It's not, it won't work otherwise. What's known as the dramatic pause. <laughs> right. You know? Right. But I mean, if you want to laugh, man, and it's, <laughs> I can, we can go on forever about the comedic aspects of this business and the different personalities I've had to contend with. You know, I mean, it's, and, and, and I'm no exception. I'm not better than any of them, man. Believe me, I'm sure there's people that will report back to you that, 
you know, crazy Ethan did this, you know. <laughs> And we've had enough guests in common between your show and me that you probably get some idea of what our crew's like. But, you know, it's, 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 it's still fun to talk about it with good humor. You know, like I said, I can, I'll be honest, as bad as Seagal's rap is, I've seen no evidence of it on a personal level. I always got along with him. He was cool. And I'll tell you when somebody's an ass. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I will, I will jump right to the point because I love to jump up and down on those kind of people. Well, Ethan, Ethan, we got one more break we're going to take, and then and then we'll be back. You going to hang yeah. with us? All right. All right, cool. Fantastic. We'll be back in just can a I second. Can I the liquor store and back in time? You can. you got you, five minutes. Yep. <laughs> I'm on my way. All right. <laughs> we'll be back in just a second, guys. You're listening to World of the Unexplained. And we're back on World of the Unexplained with Ethan Detmeyer. Ethan, the Ethan. That's right. Scrib doctor, <laughs> director, Sinjin <laughs> Smith. S-I-N, J-I-N, Colorful personality. <laughs> Snappy dresser. Drunk film critic. Monday, Monday, Monday. <laughs> <laughs> World's best cigar impersonation. You better be dead. Or <laughs> we always have a good time when you're on the road. Oh, yeah. It's always hey, fun. Man. It is fun. You're, you're our best guest. When there's nobody else to call. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to step in. Uh, come on now. Come on now. <laughs> come on. No, nah, but we, anyway, we no, love having privilege, you. Dude. I, I appreciate you actually thinking I've got something interesting to say. Oh, it's, here. it's some of the best. Um, we have some of the best shows with you. Yeah. Some, of the, bar some of the craziest shows, too. Just things are just out People of hand. People like that. Yeah. Like tonight, man. We're, you know, it's, it's, it's just crazy. We really are taking it out and chopping it up. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't really know what even that means, honestly. It's just something I, something I say. You know. Okay, it works. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Um, All right, so we're in Act Three here. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I I know I don't, I want your opinion about it because it's all over the news. Uh oh. And just you know, you can cut it down to about a two minute, or or whatever you want to do with it. But I mean, what do you think about this this uh, script writer strike that's uh, going on? That's a good question. All over entertainment. And are you a guild member, actually? Yeah, yeah. I'm not a member of the WGA, and the the reason for that is, quite frankly, their minimum wage is is was really higher than I could ever hope to earn as a writer when I started out. What what is their minimum? It's, you know, I'm not sure because I'm not a member, but it was in the neighborhood of like the thirty thousand dollar mark. And when you start out, no one's hiring a guy without credits. For oh yeah. Great. So you only hope to make a name for yourself with Seagal, Fox, or some of these other guys is to work at a very reduced rate that's affordable. A lot of production companies, they're not going to cut uh, a writer such as myself at the time with limited experience, a $30,000 check. It just didn't seem feasible to try and get that kind of money. So what I did is I remained outside the guild, although I support their strike and what they were stri- are striking for. We'll get into that in a minute. But um, it was you, just, you, know what this, you know what this means, though, Ethan, right? What? If the strike lasts any longer, we're just going to have more more of those stupid reality yeah, shows. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, because they At don't. At least football season's on now. Well, ultimately, everyone will survive the strike and come to an understanding at some point. And, you know, it's, you just have to do what you've got to do in the meantime. I mean, uh, you know, jump on your PlayStation. Now, what do you think? Yeah. you think these guys are greedy for wanting money from, from these downloads? I mean, well, from what I understand, no, I don't think so. Uh, because from what I understand, the, the present deal goes back to around 1988. Okay. Where they roughly get four cents a unit and have received four cents a unit for VHS tapes and now DVD. Okay, well, that makes sense then for them to get something for the download. Yeah. I may even be mistaken. DVD may not even be part of the past date deal. No, I think you're That's right, true. actually, because a lot of this has to do with new media stuff. Um, that didn't iTunes, even exist. Um, you know, anytime, unfortunately, which is probably why I have erratic work habits, anytime someone strikes against the studio, I'm always for it because these studios. You just hate the studio. <laughs> Hundreds of millions of dollars, and you know, I swore I'd avoid this topic. <laughs> but I mean, they've owned the land the soundstage is on for decades. Oh yeah, they lease it out for ten, twenty thousand dollars a day to a production to go in there. So they're making a lot of money, soft dollars through resources, equipment, and things like. These studios make money hand over fist, and it's very tough for me when I hear how movies have, you know, broken the billion dollar mark worldwide that we can't give the the writers an extra four cents a unit. Yeah, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and so no, nope, can't do it. <laughs> now I'll, I'll I'll preface that by saying I don't know all the intricacies of the deal, and maybe someone at the studio should sit me down and explain the arithmetic to me on it. But I mean, from an outside observer looking at the strike, I mean, it's it's hard for me. Knowing that studios are paying guys like Tom Cruise twenty to twenty five million to do a movie. Are you but telling me you can't pay the writer who created the script he's working through an extra four cents a unit? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, if, if you if you really think about it, <clears throat> the, the modern day actors are really 
historically would be more like the paupers. They're the ones that that entertained the the royalty and the and, and the other people. They they weren't ever idolized or held up to this uh, you know bigger than life thing until you know fairly recently in, in our history. Mm, that's true. But now they demand this special treatment and special. And I'm not saying. And those guys bad. back in the day, Scott, you know, they they, they wrote their own material. The studios back in the day, they took advantage of, and they're still taking advantage of people. But they took you know advantage of the actors the same way the music industry did. It's entertainment. Mm-hmm. I think you know whether it's Warner Brothers studio facilities or Warner Brothers music, they got the situation stitched up pretty tight. And I don't ever see them ever losing money on any aspect from a soundtrack well, you know, to I, the novel the novel rights. I, I showcased think, I showcased for I showcased for Warner Brothers back in two thousand one. And uh they came down and watched us and I guess they weren't that thrilled because well they didn't call us back. <laughs> but mm. I, you know They were uh, willing to risk half a million dollars. But yeah, well the front, th- well, no the thing was, I mean we uh, we showcased for Warner because we were playing with some of their artists and one of the artists we were playing with is a band called Pete that had a really good band, really great great, great sound. bunch of guys, great sound. It was you know. really new, it was really good stuff. Yeah, that was cool. And they got treated like junk from Warner mm. Brothers. You know, Warner Brothers wouldn't even give them anything proper to tour, and they were touring in a van. They're, this is a signed national act touring around in, in a van, van with a U-Haul hooked up ridiculous. to ridiculous. Yeah. Hey, I'll tell you, speaking of that, right there, funny... Funny, in honor of James Stevenson, one of your past guests, funny James Stevenson story. <laughs> okay. He was on tour. You know, James Stevenson also plays in The Alarm with Mike Peters. Yeah, yeah. And he's on the road with The Alarm. And at one point, I guess Duffy, because Stevenson also doubles as the cult, in the cult once in a while. Yeah, he told us about that. Billy Duffy at one point goes, hey, come on the ro-. He just decides to go on the road with him for like three or four days and hang around the tour bus. You know, Duffy's got nothing to do that week, I guess, right? So they're going on a tour, and, you know, they're... You know, Peters has got him, of the alarm, has got him in some beat-up tour bus, right? They pull <laughs> up to this hotel. You know, and here are some guys that would wi- widely be considered somewhat rock legends between the group of them. You know, the alarm, the cult, they've, they've done a substantial oh, yeah. amount of work that I think is respectable. And there's, well, a ma- there's a streamlined state-of-the-art tour bus right there, right? Yeah, <laughs> and it belongs to Ben Folds Five. Oh, <laughs> they're, no, they're no, North Carolina about, natives. In, you know, talk uh. about in a lot of people's opinion the exact opposite of like yeah, and you know, yeah, and they're, rock star. Ben not Folds even, Five. and they're from our state. That's the unfortunately sad part of that whole thing. I ben mean, they're Folds fine yeah. for their own from thing, here. but I mean, you know, no, they're not. They're not the cult. They're yeah, not they're, the it's, it's just the, well, I mean, Ben Folds for, Five. For, is, for those of us, well, you know. Uh, I mean, for me, it's anyway, gay. I'd, I, of course, I'd much rather listen to The Cult or The Alarm than I would Ben Folds. Yeah, I think, I think Ben and, Folds and is right? gay, too, isn't he? But it's a funny <laughs> thing. So I guess, you know, they were all looking at this. Stu- you know, they were sort of the seasoned rock guys. Yeah. Right? They knew how the... How the they've been there, the done that for years, decades. I said they've been there. They've done that for decades. Well, this is where the story is going, right? They know the business. They know that everything you do in the studio and on the road is deducted from your pay. Oh, Yeah. And they know the whole deal, right? So they're pulling up, and there's, you know, Ben Folds 5 and, and you know, the streamlined state-of-the-art bus, and they're all looking at it. And, you know, I guess Stevenson goes, holy, you know, crap, <laughs> whose bus is that? And, you know, somebody's like, oh, it's Ben Folds 5. And he goes, look at that bus. And, you know, Duffy goes, well, that's why Ben Folds 5 and Mike Peters Folds 50. If you don't know the music business, I just wasted your time. But if you know the music business, it's funny. That's why Ben Folds Five and Mike Peters Folds Fifty. But it's funny because here's all these guys that were sort of established in the '80s and '90s getting off a bus, going, "Sucker, this is how you end up broke in ten years." Yeah, exactly. I'm yeah, sure that's exactly where they are now, too. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. I mean, you never hear of them anymore. No. Well, I can't tell you how many high-profile music acts over the years that we can find at home barely making it because the music companies have basically taken their rights to everything and have taken oh yeah you know the publishing and it the, the licensing and it's just it's very it's sad in a lot of ways it's there's very little reserve for the artist these days yeah you hear their song or whatever on some kind of um uh cool up commercial or something or where are yeah. they now <laughs> you know h1 playing you know 10 times during an eagles game and the the, the chances are the guy who wrote it may have signed away his rights to it and and you know, got nothing. You know, you know, you know an entity that's making money on like the Beatles Revolution. You know, well, you know, you know, Willie Nelson. He sold the rights to Crazy to Patsy Cline. You know how much he sold those for? 
How much? Four hundred dollars to cover a bar tab in the bar he was playing in that night. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. He drank a four hundred dollar bar oh, yeah, tab. Him, him and his boys. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> just Willie. Like mm. Willie. It was Willie and the band and oh, the crew. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was like, he himself drank a four hundred dollar bar yeah, tab. Yeah, he didn't make enough that night. They were playing. He didn't make enough to cover the bar tab. And uh, Patsy Cline's manager came up to him in the bar and said, "Hey, man, we like that song, Crazy. Would you sell it to us?" And he said, "Yeah, if you'll cover my bar tab, it's yours." Wow. Oh, so I'm, I'm sure he's kicking himself now. Hey, well. Hats off to Willie Nelson for not hanging himself. <laughs> well, he still plays the song, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. But, I mean, that's one of those things where it's like, oh, man. Missed the boat me. on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah here's, a, here's a totally uh, off-topic thing. Um, but it's kind of related to, to uh, the 13th Warrior because that movie, inevitably, I never really got around to asking, you know, the Beowulf references because, I mean, Beowulf is by and far one of my favorite uh, pieces of literature ever. Uh, what do you think about this new Beowulf movie, Ethan? I haven't seen it yet. I mean, what, you know, you seen previews or um, for it or anything like that? Uh, no, it looks like a kid's cartoon to me. I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. But, I mean, you know, production value, for what it's worth, I mean, there's so many great ways to capture that story on film, and it looks like they preferred to kind of make it almost like an animated movie that yeah. we time special. Well, so what, stupid. What, what our listeners don't know is that Ethan and, and myself and the guys here at Woe to have put together something that we're working on. I, I'm going to be acting as producer for it. We can't tell you. We can't let the cat out of the bag it's just top yet. Secret. It's top yeah, secret. Way to but it's it's going to be awesome, though. Am I, am I not right here, Ethan? It's going to be awesome stuff. What? I'm sorry. I, I, what was the last bit of that? I said it's going to be awesome, though. I just can't well, talk about it. I would agree it. it's an awesome concept, and I would thank you for taking your audience down a road where we cannot even let the cat out of the window. <laughs> <today. laughs> oh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Now that we've just wrecked the... <laughs> hey, man, we're doing something awesome. But we can't tell. tell. It's the great. It's so cool. It's triple top you secret. You can't know anything oh, wow. about it we're for doing months. Something. It kicks ass. Quiet. Quiet. <laughs> but we can't but, tell. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, you know, that's a nice little Easter egg. You know, once, once, we get, once we get everything in place, you know, in the next few months and tie down everything, we'll, uh, we'll be able to talk about right. it probably. Let All me right. just put it this way. Chase Scott is always thinking. That's right. Always. <laughs> you know, but uh, real quick, since it is sort of a sort of a Dennis Storhey type night, and I'm sorry, like I said, if I sounded like James Lipton during the interview, but him oh, no, just no. grasping English, I felt kind of like... No, a, I'm glad, and I'm glad you kind of took the reins on that, because I, I really had, didn't I know like where to he, go he's, with it. He's a good friend of mine, and I had to somewhat steer him, because he's not 100% sure how to phrase things up, in a way. And it was but, so it's so early in the morning there, yeah, I, yeah. you know, I, I, oh, I we woke to catch... Him up. Yeah, and, I, and, and that, he's a real trooper for doing yeah, that. Yeah, we woke the guy up. I could tell during the conversation that we woke that guy out of a deep sleep to do the interview, which is good. My hat's off to him. But, yeah, there is a definite connection between Beowulf and a 13th Warrior because a 13th Warrior is sort of a cross between Beowulf, which Crichton openly admits. I mean, that's not anything anyone's got to detect to find out. But yeah. It's a sort of a cross between um, Beowulf and I think the hey, Seven Samurai. Maybe maybe film. so. Yeah, yeah good, I, I can no see that. never really fessed up to that, but it's sort of like a... The, it follows really the story of the Seven Samurai in a way, also, even except there's uh, thirteen of them. Yeah, I mean, you know, these guys come in to save the the village or whatever of this terrible, terrible plight, and lots of them die, and and you know, it's very epic and big. And yeah, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's um, so. yeah, at some point, it's it's eerily close to it. I mean, they go from where they go to the, attacking the fortress of the guys to to the just to the characters, the way you know, one guy's very quiet. And he's like the tracker. One guy's very joyous, and you know it's almost like yeah. characters. And, and, and for those for those of you that That's haven't, an interesting uh, comparison. <clears throat> well, for those of you listening that haven't seen either the Thirteenth Warrior or the Seventh Samurai, go, go out and, and rent these. You can pick these up. That's right, Akira Buster. Kurosawa, one of great, his great one of his stuff. classic films. And don't don't yeah, get turned I, off because you know it's in black and white. I mean, pick that thing up. It's a great great film. No, it's learn some good good cinema, people. It's yeah. without a doubt one of the best movies ever made. Another movie by Kurosawa everyone should check out is uh, Sinjuro. And if you want to see a, a good film, that one's also well worth your time. And you know, somewhere we were talking during the break, somewhere out there, there is a director's cut of a Thirteenth Warrior that is above and beyond what what the audience yeah. sort of had to suffer through in theaters because the studio just butchered that movie to hell and it yeah. like I was Dennis knows it we we said it on the air you know the move the movie was it it underachieved well for a reason and somewhere there's actually probably a very epic cut of that movie that's probably worth a much watching. better I version I encourage people to go see it it's not a bad way no, to it's, it's no, a really it good it movie. is a lot 
And I'm sure eventually they're gonna they're, they'll release that on some kind of super collector's edition special that they'll charge you know fifty dollars well, for. And you know, we yeah. were talking about that because Dennis doesn't know anything about it, um, uh, uh, but. I, I would think it's following the studio pattern of a director's cut coming your way because they're, it's suddenly on cable all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really making a strong cable run, and that's a good sign that they're about to release a different version of it. Yeah. Well, Ethan, Ethan, I hate to let you go, but I'm going to give you a last word because we've only got a couple minutes here. Um, well, what do you... What do you want to talk about for two minutes? <laughs> what can we bore your audience with? You want to talk about the brush fires that took most of my neighborhood out? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, th- this is a really funny story because I was talking to Ethan about it, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, uh, he's like, I've got to put out a couple fires, and he's like, I'll call you right back. And so I'm like, okay. <clears throat> well, I'm thinking he's talking about, you know, talking to some people and getting some stuff taken care of. And then since yeah. I got off the phone, I'm like, well, maybe he means real fires. Oh, my gosh, because California's burning. You know, this yeah. is a couple weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> everywhere. There's fire everywhere. It turns uh, out, the, yeah. It's the real thing. My house is a command post for Monday. Well, didn't they, they, they asked you to actually evacuate, didn't they? We got the mandatory evacuation order twice, but both times I ignored it because I just felt compelled to try and do everything I could to save my house. Before. Yeah, that's right. the evacuation center and wondered what was happening, right? Yeah. That's but, I mean, I got off much more fortunate than some people. I mean, my backyard's gone, but... A good part of my neighborhood devastated, oh, man. and it was funny because the wrestler um, Al Snow. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yeah, yeah. He called my house just to to, to tell me something, and my wife picks up the phone and goes, uh, "No, Al, he's actually on the roof watering it down with the <laughs> the hose." And she goes, "You want to talk to him?" And she hands me the phone, and I'm like, "Hey, Al, can I call you back? I got a 40 foot flames developed, you know, devouring the house four doors down." Well, we're glad you well, listen, made it through Ethan, that. Ethan, we got 45 seconds, so um, you can take the show out with us. How does that sound? What's that? Take what? You can take the show out with us. We've got 45 you know seconds. We're, we're, we're you know, honestly, signing off. The best, the best thing to do after what we just talked about briefly is to just salute the firefighters that lay it on the line for people in their homes. Definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. That's, the that was way, a, that's the best way I can think to end the show. It's a hard that's job. I've lately. All right. Awesome. Well, Ethan, uh, thanks for being on the show, and I will, uh, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, you got it, man. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All, All right. right. Thanks, thanks Ethan. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, Ethan Detmeyer. we got 20 seconds, man. Wow. We pushed Could that we to cut the it? limit. Can we cut it any closer? No. <laughs> Go ahead, Scott. <laughs> All right, it's Jay Scott. You're only JD DJ on the Omnisound Radio 1 Network saying this, later. This is Trey Lackey. Come to Kernsville, North Carolina. Talk small town. Talk about big things. Chuck Browder. We out.